Hello, everyone. Well, I'm, I'm uh, really glad you all seem super interested in my thesis topic. It seems just, just like you'd be thrilled. But uh, thankfully, today my topic is something a little bit more relatable. Uh, specifically, and I, you've, you can see I've titled it, titled it Your Data and You. So what I'm going to uh, go through is this change in how uh, our society interacts with information, interacts with data, where we've gone from statistics being something generalizable, something about broad swaths of people. Now we have so much information about ourselves and we create so much information in what we do every day that it profoundly changes the way we actually interact with others and can interact with ourselves. This is not working. There we go. Okay. So there are kind of these two paradigms in statistics. So the first is that one where a statistic is a generalization, and it talks about a population. It's not about you or me, but about us. Uh, this stuff you could see in a census, in a, you know, in a poll, and it's great. It gives us a lot of information, but it doesn't tell us uh, anything about any individual member of the sample. This new era in statistics that we've entered into is that we can collect so much statistic, uh, so many statistics in such volume on individual people that we can actually gain statistically valid uh, um, insights about individual people. So again, if you see this old paradigm in scientific studies, in opinion polling, but now we see statistics on individual people being applied, especially in your purchasing habits, if you have a loyalty card, uh, your browsing history, if you use a browser like Internet Explorer, Google Chrome, Firefox, they all use this to personalize your experience. And most interestingly, most interestingly for me, personal health. So instead of getting services that target people like us, so where you'd have department stores target certain segments of the population with their advertising pushes, you now get services that are made for us, for us specifically. You will know this if you've ever gone to Amazon, that everything there is actually very specifically tailored to you, not just people who uh, fit your demographic. And there's a double-edged sword to this, because we all like cheaper things on Amazon. We all like to have uh, things that are tailor-made for us, ready delivered, very easily accessible. But the, re the way they're able to do this is because we produce all of this data with every link that, uh, link that we click, uh, with everything that we buy. We leave a little piece of data behind, and that's what other people use to make their uh, decisions about what they think we will like and uh, make kind of bring that to kind of a point of sale. This, however, it's, again, going back to the benefits of it, it's not all about the dangers, however. It can give us more, less trivial benefits than just cheaper you know, socks on Amazon or cheaper toilet paper. I've done that before. It's a really good idea, buying toilet paper on Amazon. You reach a place where you're, you're wondering what your life has come to. Um, <laughs> So my, my specific area of interest is health data. And this is extremely revealing. And it's largely come about because we're able to collect health data much more easily than we ever have before. Health data used to be collected uh, in a laboratory environment all the time, very strict standardized conditions. Uh, but it was only ever collected on small groups of people. Now, um, can I get people to raise your hands if you have Fitbit or Withings, like some kind of tracker? One of your, there we go. Yeah, a lot of people wear them now because it, it's this passive data collection that you can actually use to make yourself healthier. There are, this is not just you know, how many steps you take, how many floors you climb. This is seen in all manners of activities. Um, recently, a um, hospital in, in Israel developed a wearable blood glucose monitor so that diabetics no longer need to stab themselves five times a day. Instead, they only need to test maybe once or twice a day while getting continuous data simply because they're wearing a watch. So I was recently diagnosed with diabetes, and this is what uh, made me interested in this topic. Now, before about the 1990s, the late 80s, it was really difficult to manage because it was hard to collect this personal data on yourself. Blood glucose monitoring, where you monitor how much sugar is in your blood uh, to reduce the risk of complications, was really difficult. 
Uh, now, the testing is relatively low cost, it's ubiquitous, and it's paired with all of these other personalized information services. Uh, you can look at, you know, what's your basal meta metabolic rate, how many calories are you burning, how many, carbs, how many carbs do you need each day, versus, you know, how is that going to change your blood sugar. And it allows you to network with other people with similar conditions and learn best practices. Speaking of that, my tracker just told me I had my 10,000th step from wobbling back and forth, so <laughs> there we go. And the most important thing probably is that this is all extraordinarily cheap. That this is cheaper than it's ever been because of the proliferation of computing power in our society. Uh, one of the most kind of important changes in our civilization is how everyone, even if they don't have, you know, even if they don't have a high school degree, can go online and actually find data, use data, and uh, have access to this computing power that only, you know, in my parents' generation, you were having to, you know, rent out hours and hours of computer time. I've heard those stories with the punch cards. It's just not that way anymore, and that's uh, being seen in this aspect of our life. So I'll show you a little of my data. What I do is I feed it into my phone, it goes onto Google Spreadsheets, nothing fancy. But what it does is essentially it gives me the ability to see vital statistics about how my blood sugar monitoring is going. So over the last month, this, this is a little bit old, but over the last month, my out of range readings fell by you know, almost to nothing. Um, I've, I'm on target about 70% of the time and I can see that because my standard deviation is going down, it's, there's less range in what my blood sugar readings are. It's getting towards that healthy mean. And this means that I can keep track of my progress really easily. We don't have to go punch, crunch it every time. There's no big paper spreadsheets. It's very low maintenance, and this is what helps me manage my condition. So I can see you know, a general decline, a decrease in the number of spikes, stuff to encourage me. And you know, variation throughout the day. So I can think, what should I expect at this time of day? What should I expect my readings to be? And I was only diagnosed about two months ago, so this was a very quick learning curve for me, and it helped me establish, you know, what should I think of as normal, what should I think of as my bounds, and helped me learn about how my body reacts to this condition, because every diabetic is a little bit different. And so this, the, the thing with personal uh, data monitoring is that it does give results. There's this idea um, called the Hawthorne effect. It was developed during a study on the effect of lighting on factory productivity. And the, the kind of finding was that it wasn't as much the change that was being made that, that was creating results, but people knew that they were being watched. And when you know you're being watched, if you know something's being observed, you make these passive changes in your life to improve that value because you don't want to let yourself down, you don't want to kind of create an outlier, you want to, you want to feel good about the data that you're creating, your results. And so things like fitness trackers, things like, you know, when you when for me when I'm measuring my blood glucose, everything is now geared towards I don't want to let myself down, so I'm going to like not have that donut. I'm going to eat a little bit better. I'm going to you know walk to the further grocery store instead and you know, rack up those steps. And this is something that's been shown again and again that you can make very profound changes to your life without really doing anything consciously active. This. My kind, of, my kind of example with medical data is relatively trivial, actually, compared to what it's used for now in health sciences, where you see that personalized healthcare solutions are being made more and more available. Kind of the most, for me, the most interesting and dramatic example going on right now is that uh, scientists have gotten near to being able to release what's been termed in the diabetes community a artificial pancreas. It's not some organ grown in the lab. It's three sets of pumps. Uh, one measures the, the blood sugar level. One injects a hormone that raises, raises blood sugar. The other one injects insulin to lower it. And it uses an algorithm, uses a small computer on board to calculate, you know, what is this individual's sensitivity to insulin after you know, different types of activity, just normally after different types of food. And as it learns about that individual person, it gradually brings the uh, blood sugar levels into a more normal range so that there aren't the spikes or the troughs that are very dangerous to our health. And this is 
a really important innovation because for type 1 diabetics, who are usually very young, um, young children often, you know, going to sleep is a risk because if they have a trough, if they go really low while they're sleeping, they can go into a coma. This kind of personalized data solution makes sure that that doesn't happen. It means that these diabetics can go and, you know, have pizza without worrying about what's going to happen to them, and in some cases, if they're going to wake up in the morning. And as I mentioned before, this does have a dark side. I mean, nothing really, nothing good ever comes without one. It's kind of in this fixation of stories that we've told ourselves for thousands of years that we don't ever get anything good without a dark side. And we've all heard of the stories coming out of the National uh, Security Agency in the United States where they collect tons and tons of data um, on Americans and on people abroad and what they do with that data. Now, the, what originally got the NSA in the news was its collection of cell phone metadata. Cell phone metadata is not the content of your calls. It is who you called, when you called them, where you were, how long it was, who is your provider, that kind of information. All of that peripheral data. And people's first reaction is, okay, fine. Like, they don't know what I'm talking about. That's still a private phone call. And uh, that was something we were quickly disabused of. Because one of the advantages of having that much information on that many people is that you can make a lot of really statistically valid and interesting conclusions really easily. Uh, think about when you use your phone. It's, you're now giving the NSA kind of a, a tour of what you do with your day. So you know, maybe you, you know, where, you, where you're working, what bus route you take to work, uh, how, when you leave work, all of these things, because each SMS and each text leaves that footprint, suddenly they know what your likely travel itinerary is, to, is likely to be. They know who your best friends are, who uh, they should include in their searches uh, when they're looking through your network. And it's very revealing information. And so it's, it's promoted this very healthy discussion about what should we do with our data. And some, some jurisdictions, for example, Germany, have gone uh, really far to one side, where German privacy laws, in part born out of East Germany's experience with the, um, the Stasi, which even collected people's smells, that's how far the Stasi went on collecting personal information. Um, Germany has done things like ban Street View, ban uh, certain locations in Google Earth, just has really doubled down on this idea that your privacy is actually um, a paramount interest and can't just be passively signed away. That, however, has the disadvantage of, um, it has the disadvantage of stymieing new developments. And a lot of the developments that have given us uh, really great advantages, even if they're trivial, like, you know, again, Amazon, Spotify, all these services which use personal information uh, to sell us what we want. There's also another wrinkle here because this ubiquitously available private health data can have negative implications as well. For example, if you want to get your DNA tested, you will find out about your probability of contracting any number of conditions. If you go to, sci if you go to register for insurance, you then need to list that as a pre-existing condition or that you know that that might be a pre-existing condition. Until recently in the United States, it was legal to deny someone insurance coverage based on their pre-existing conditions. And so it created an environment where it was actually bad to know about yourself, bad to know about your health. And that's a troubling place to be in. The insurer, has, the insurer has a reasonable interest in making sure that they know the health status of their uh, subjects. But at the same time, uh, it creates that conflict of interest, which can be dangerous to everyone. So the question here is like, where to draw the line. And unlike a lot of people at these kind of talks, I'm not coming with a solution, because it's part of this conversation we need to have as a society. But where to draw the line? Data is clearly an important part of our lives. It's an important part of how we do business and how we work and play. But you know, if you're going to quote, if I, if I can quote Spider-Man here, you know, with great power comes great responsibility, and it's important that we realize what we're leaving behind when we go through Amazon, when we go on Facebook, and we need to talk about as a society what our privacy privacy laws should be, what should be 
What should we assume about how our data is being used? Who owns our data? And what are the acceptable uses of that data? Most importantly, though, I want to stress that we shouldn't see data as something artificial that exists kind of outside of us. It should be something that is personal, that's something that reflects who we are and that we use for self-reflection. It can help us change our lives in really important ways and lead the best lives we can. And so I'd like to thank you and just hope you think about that and next time you go on Facebook, what you're leaving behind. <laughs>